Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, or welcome back, again, as the case might be. My name is Dalibor Petrovic, and over the last few years, I've been the host of these Deloitte live webcasts we've been producing and bringing to you. Um, as you would probably know, we use this live channel to bring to you conversations with tech executives to allow them to tell their stories and talk to us about cool things that are working on, but we are also using this channel to share uh, Deloitte's thought leadership. And today uh, I am thrilled to announce a new series of uh, three uh, live webcast conversations that we are going to have over the course of the next month on the topic of mapping value from digital transformations. So we're going to be unpacking both what we mean by digital transformation and then we're going to share the research that we've conducted over the last uh, number of months that has resulted in a new framework that I feel is absolutely spectacular that will help us uh, first of all, understand where to actually look for value and then how to actually measure it and, and report it back. Um, so today's session is live, which means two things. First, bear any technical glitches we might have. But second, more importantly, you can engage with our speakers, of course, by using the Q&A function of this Zoom platform. Uh, so without much further ado, we're going to go into the conversation. This is episode one. And today, in today's episode, I am thrilled to be uh, joined by two of my friends and colleagues, Diana Kearns-Manolatos. Uh, Diana is the... Uh, lead researcher of Deloitte Global Researcher uh, in Tech Transformations, joining us from New York. Thank you, Diana, for finding the time to be with us in our audiences today. Lovely to see you. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And, and Greg Dost, who is the uh, Technology Strategy and Business Transformation Leader uh, of the, out of Deloitte US, joining us this morning, actually this afternoon now, from Boston. Thanks, you, Greg. Excellent. So I know that we have a very intense conversation to be had. Uh, Diana, I'm going to pass the button over to you. Maybe what we can do is just very briefly give us a context of your role and maybe quick intro, and then we can sort of get into the conversation as, and our audiences, please lean in and ask any questions you might have. Let's have a good chat. Over to you, Diana. So hi, everyone. I'm Diana kearns Monolatos. I am based in New York. I'm part of the Deloitte Center for Integrated Research. And so what I do on our research team is I look at technology transformation um, globally and in the U.S., looking at market and technology and cultural trends that are impacting Deloitte's clients. Um, in the near term. And over the last two and a half years, I've been leading our research on technology value. So I'm really glad to be sharing some of our uh, most recent research and findings on that topic. Wonderful. All righty, so let's 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 flip the slide. And I think that what we will do, um, Greg, the moment I think that at some point, of course, Greg, you're going to be able to you're going to lean into this as well, and just maybe give us a br brief intro of you as well, and then we can we can we can we can start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Greg Dost, I am a partner in Deloitte's tech strategy and business transformation practice in the U.S. I'm based in Connecticut outside of uh, the New York area, but uh, happen to be in Boston today. Um, and I spend my days working with technology leaders of global organizations on developing enterprise technology strategy and um, everything that goes along with the implementation of those strategies. Um, I also have the good fortune of getting to work with Diana and others on our research agenda so that we are codifying the knowledge uh, that we get by being out in the market um, and sharing that with you all um, for, uh, for a collective benefit. Um, let's go ahead and jump in then if we can. <clears throat> Thank you, Diana. Uh, so topic for today, right? Digital transformation is top of mind for executives across all industries and all geographies, it seems. And it has been for some time. I'm sure that comes as a surprise to absolutely nobody um, who, who's joining this call. Uh, but as we've been out with, uh, with our clients and uh, with technology leaders and business leaders out in the market talking about this topic, perhaps not surprisingly, seven, nearly seven in 10 of the leaders um, that we have spoken to in our research 
tell us that digital transformation is the single most important investment mm. that they're making within their enterprise to drive enterprise value today. At the same time, just more than seven in 10, so slightly more than that number, um, tell us that they struggle to define the metrics um, that they're going to use to measure the value from those investments. So we've got a really interesting conundrum here, um, one that we drilled into in the research that's going to be the focus of this series of conversations. For that research, what we did was we collaborated with NYU's Stern School of Business to survey over 1,600 business leaders globally. And what we're trying to do in surveying them was to understand the scope and scale of their digital transformation ambitions, as well as the metrics that they're using to gauge the return that they get on those investments. The top line finding is exactly what you see here, which is that while most organizations see digital transformation as the most important investment they can make today, they struggle to measure the value that they produce um, from their transformations. And if we think about that for just a mm -hmm. moment, step back from the research, what other major investment are we seeing organizations um, today putting at the top of their portfolio for which they're going to their executive teams, they're going to their boards, they're going out to the market and saying, I don't actually know how to measure the value. It's that incredible. Getting. Isn't it incredible to just think about that for a moment? That just that statement is shocking, but for all of us who are in the midst of this, it actually feels true, right? It feels that this is very, very factual. 70% say this is the most important thing. More than 70% says we don't know how to measure this. <gasps> wow. <laughs> And, and, you know, what's interesting too is that this is, um, this was not our starting point for our research either, right? So the research that we've been doing over the last couple of years has led up to that sort of big aha moment. Uh, Maybe, yeah. Let me give a little bit of background then also to, to give you a sense of how we got to even having this conversation. Uh, now, our foundational research, which Diana, what was it back in 2022, this is almost two years ago now, um, yeah. we were our first uh, piece in this series. And that, that piece made the case for, in principle, fundamentally changing how organizations talk about the value of digital investment, right? So there was sort of that inkling that this was a topic that was going to be of interest. Um, and if we're saying, okay, let's change how you talk um, about digital transformation and the value you get from it, um, then our next piece in the series said, okay, well, let's actually look at how people talk um, about those investments. And so that subsequent piece, um, it, not surprisingly coinciding with the explosion of AI um, across the market, what we ended up doing was using AI-enabled um, analysis, using NLP analysis to show how organizations that talk differently about strategic digital investments, in fact, see hard dollar differences in performance vis-a-vis -vis market cap, right? So what we did in that case was we took about 4,500, I believe was Diana organizations, right? that we went out yeah. and we looked at. We gathered 10Ks um, and, and equivalent documents, basically documents that tell us how those organizations talk to the outside world, how they talk to the market um, about the strategic choices that they're making. And we looked at four indices. Number one was how you talk about, the language you use to talk about your business strategy. Number two is the language you use to talk about your digital transformation ambitions. Number three is language you use to talk about specific technology investments that you're making to bring it to life. And number four is to talk about, uh, sorry, number four is looking at the language around how organizations talk about change enablement. Um, what we found then was that there are different combinations organizations use. Mm -hmm. Some are using all of that language in high proximity, meaning within the same breath, those organizations are talking about their strategic enterprise goals and mm -hmm. they're linking those ambitions to digital transformation and they're contextualizing those with specific technologies and saying, here's how we enable that change. Other organizations get pieces and parts of that, but not the totality of that language again in the same breath. And what we found was truly astonishing. The ones who do it best, the ones who can talk about that all cohesively versus the ones who have the biggest challenges um, in stringing that message together, see upwards of a 14 percentage point differential wow. in market cap over time. And that is a reflection of how they're valued in the market. Um, what we saw then is if all of the organizations we looked at got it right, I'm sorry, if all the organizations in the Fortune 500 got that equation right, that would add $1.25 trillion in value to the market. Jeez. If all of those organizations got it wrong, that would equate to 
trillion dollars in value erosion. This is high stakes stuff that we're talking about. And with this research, we've been able to quantify it. Mm. So ju just for, for, for me and for the benefit of our audience to summarize what you just said is that there are three elements that that when, ta when taken together and executed, delivered together in cohesiveness results in actual value, measurable value uplift, increase in value. And that is clarity on the digital strategy and ambition for the enterprise. So clarity on that. Clarity on the technology investments made to achieve that vision and ambition and efforts in digital change management and ability to actually make organizational change, right? When those three things are in place, then great things happen. And if elements of those things are not in place, elements of those things are not in place, then we have erosion of, 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 of value. Actually, not necessarily erosion. The erosion happens, if I understand correctly. The worst case scenario is when you have a digital strategy and ambition, when you make technology investments, but you fail to mobilize the change, digital change. That, that scenario is the worst possible scenario, right? And it's effectively when you have some of the pieces, but not all of the pieces. Yeah. Of yeah. The puzzle. Um, this is very powerful insight. This is extremely important. And it, yeah. it was, and we saw a lot of interest around that, but it won't surprise a lot of people, I suppose, that when we started having that conversation, folks said, okay, well, let's bring this to, you know, back to my day-to-day -day reality. And we're talking about ways that you measure value. By the way, the metric that you're using, we talked about this in terms of value as reflected market cap, that's not a metric that a lot of organizations today use to quantify the value that they're getting from digital transformation investments. And so that was what led us to this piece of research, right? Which is where we say, how can we really mature the way hmm. that we're thinking about measuring and tracking the value an organization sees from digital investment? Yep. So step one in that process, I know this is sort of step three in the research, step one um, in the process um, of this stage of research is that we started with some basic questions. We went out, we surveyed those 1600 leaders and we said, um, you know, first and foremost, what types of things is your organization investing in? What types of technologies and digital changes are we talking about? Number two is how much value do you actually believe that you are gaining um, from those investments? And so um, we've got a nice visual here, then that will sort of show where, where the audience landed. Um, and you'll see there's a number of things. These data points that are on the page here are specific technology investments that organizations may be making. Um, you see all the way in the upper right-hand side of this data and analytics, um, highest area of investment, highest perceived value. Uh, Diana <laughs> knows well that when we do this type of research, though, my eye always goes to the lower left corner, right? Yeah. It goes to uh, what's not being said or what's not being uh, valued. Right. I will add the caveat as I call out some of those things in the lower left. You'll see on the, um, if on the X axis, you have the um, investment that organizations, relative investment that organizations are making in these technologies. On the Y axis, you have a measure of perceived value that those organizations mm -hmm. are getting. This doesn't go all the way down to zero. So we're not talking about people saying no value. We're yeah. hearing them say relative to other things, they're seeing less value, less return. Um, but what fascinated me about that was when we were looking at it, look at some of those things. You have augmented and immersive reality. You have speech and gesture interfaces. You have deep learning. Um, you even have conversational AI in there. Um, these are not, uh, you know, these are not sort of uh, random kind of, you know, pie in the sky concepts that organizations are playing around with. These are all very current and very relevant technologies, um, but they are investments for which organizations have a lower level of confidence and the value that they're going to get yeah. out of this. You know, I looked at this for the first time and I said to myself, okay, well, you know, that sort of makes sense where we spend more money, we tend to see better ROI. Um, where we spend less money, we tend to see less ROI. There's another interpretation where you may say, okay, things that are newer, like those things we see in the lower left, tend to have lower ROI ascribed to them, perhaps because they are newer, right? And we haven't had as much time to prove out the value. Um, instinctively, that all kind of made sense. But then we pause and we ask ourselves, you know, um, beyond what feels sort of instinctive here, 
these are highly transformative investments, um, many of which are, are fundamental, are, they're foundational to the AI revolution that we're seeing today. Um, and perhaps what we need to do is we need to have a better story for how we tell the value, a more comprehensive story for how we tell the value that we're getting from those investments, rather than just saying they're newer, of course, they're not producing the same ROI. So we then ask the question, how do we change that conversation? Um, and that is, uh, it's a bit of, I didn't wear my glasses today. And so I'm remembering it's a bit of an eye chart here, but allow me to break this down for you. It, in effect, what we did was um, we came up with a framework that has five different categories within it. You see in the center there, financial, customer and client, process, workforce, purpose, five categories of KPIs that organizations can be using to measure value of digital transformation investments. Yeah. Those categories break into 10 subcategories, which further break into 46 different KPIs. Um, I'm gonna call your eye just very quickly um, to the financial category, because you'll see within financial, we have traditional KPIs, we have digital sales KPIs, and we have non-traditional KPIs. And in effect, what that says is, we know there are certain metrics, or we at least intuited at the beginning of this, that there were certain metrics that a lot of organizations have been trained to use, right? I've been in this particular, um, you know, part of my career for, uh, you know, the last 20 years and uh, have been trained to use certain metrics um, every one of those 20 years for how we talk about it. those are those traditional financial mm -hmm. metrics. The non-traditional ones, though, are ones where we say, hey, you know, these are measures of value that CFOs and the boards and CEOs care about. Um, you know, but maybe they don't get the same attention when we're talking about digital transformation investments. So within that framework, we have the 46 KPIs and you see on the page here, some of the findings. Um, finding number one is about telling the full value story. So this is out of 46 uh, value KPIs, only 26 are used by only half of organizations. Yeah. Um, it, sort of half and half, right? What that means is when you have all of these options for how you can tell a comprehensive story, most organizations tend to narrow in on a specific subset. Um, and in my experience, right, a lot of those are the subset that a lot of us have been trained on over the years to focus traditional on. Traditional ones, right? Exactly, exactly, in the traditional category. Um, you know, number two is that the organizations that do this well, they say, okay, well, we're having trouble measuring value they say this is also a very solvable challenge, right? Um, as an example, when we did our research, and you can see this if you if you go to the detailed findings in the um, study that, that we published online, um, there are, for a lot of organizations, clear blind spots. And so organizations that are leading in this space come into it and say, I know there are certain metrics I tend to go to. I want to focus on where I have blind spots. I want to diversify. Um, the metrics. And that leads to finding number three, which is that those leading organizations, um, they will tend to avoid over-indexing on a few types of KPIs. So there's a version of this visual where we actually show the percentage of organizations that are using each of these 46 KPIs. And what you see in that view, which you can find in the study, is that there are clusters, right? The traditional financial metrics often you have clusters of high popularity and you have clusters of low popularity. And those leading organizations tend to look across the board. Um, and then number four is, is that organizations that are doing this holistically, they have a common mindset in the sense that um, they are 20% more likely to ascribe higher value to their digital transformation investments because they have that holistic um, message around how they talk about value. So that's a little bit of a, a sort of really more of a teaser on the framework and some of the initial findings. Um, Diana, I'm just curious um, because you, you've got a wealth of knowledge uh, that hides behind each of these visuals that we have. Anything that you would add on this view? Thanks, Greg. Um, I would just double down on point number three about the over-indexing. We have it here on the slide. Productivity is the top measure that we see number one use. Um, and if we were looking at the clusters, we would see that many of the financial customer and process measures, really the right side of, of this is lit up 
um, and that workforce and purpose measures in particular are where we start to see a lot of the gap. There are some differences, which, you know, as we continue the discussion, we can talk about um, from an industry perspective where some industries have different priorities versus the others. But overall, it's the traditional financial KPIs tend to be very high overall. Um, the traditional customer engagement KPIs and then process performance. And so to, you know, to take a page from Greg's book and highlight, well, what aren't people looking at then? Look, they're not looking at digital sales, which seems like a big miss. They're not looking at new product planning, which also seems like a pretty big miss. Um, and then in terms of purpose overall, you know, we have nine KPIs here under purpose. And um, some of the big issues that organizations are talking about today, like sustainability, organizational resilience, and organizational mission fit or corporate reputation, fit under and DEI fit under this purpose category. And yep. so we see that purpose KPIs overall in terms of maturity and usage are currently at a much lower um, use than some of these other KPIs. This is this is very interesting. And actually, we are seeing a similar trend. I just had a conversation with our Gen AI managing partner leader. Uh, and the conversation there is that initial push to leverage Gen AI was optimization and productivity. And people have kind of missed the opportunity to think about new revenue, new services, new product. And it, it seems to be exactly the same story here that just spread over a longer time. That yeah. it feels like people are driving this with the intention to optimize, to automate, to get in, in additional productivity and missing the opportunity for the actual transformation capital T in many cases. Yeah. Is that is that fair sentiment? Yeah, so I'll jump in first and then Greg, if you have anything to add, but I, I'm excited you brought up generative AI because how can you be having a conversation about technology these days without mentioning it? Um, so go. to address the gen AI elephant in the room, um, you know, this study, we collected this data in 2023, um, which is exciting because I think we have a really good baseline now of how organizations were thinking about value sure. before they got caught up with generative AI. Um, Deloitte published our um, state of generative AI wave one study in January. And so our team um, is fortunate enough to be part of leading that global study. And um, I've spent some time looking at that data and we just published um, a piece last week that brings together some of that generative AI data with this framework. Um, to be able to see how organizations have been thinking traditionally about AI investment. And we see many of the same types of trends here. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the expected benefits of generative AI, um, yes to what you said, overall that data shows that productivity and um, is high in terms of expected benefits and innovation types of benefits are low. But when we further explored that data, what we actually saw is that there's a big gap in the expectations between business leaders of the generative AI technology and technology leaders in what generative AI can do. And so our recommendation from that new research um, connected with this is look to the technology leaders for what that technology is capable of doing um, so that you can you know, close the gap between business and technology leader expectations and really learn from the technical expertise about what the capability of the technology is. And if it's productivity, then great. Um, but if, you know, if the way that you're looking to use it is to generate content and experiences and visuals and value, which is, is what generative AI is, is differentiated in doing as a capability, is that really about achieving productivity or should it be about something else? I love it. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Yeah, yeah not, not to steal your thunder, Diana, because I know you're going to get to this in just a moment, right? There's an important <clears throat> um, lesson that that context of uh, one of our colleagues refers to as um, generative AI for process and generative AI for product, right? 
And so, and by the way, that's that's not exclusively limited to generative AI. That could apply in a number of other um, yeah. contexts. But generative AI is a process efficiency play, which you might use efficiency metrics, right, Diana, like you're talking about, um, to measure. That's very different from when you say our transformation ambitions are more about how we embed generative AI so that we're able to bring different products and services out to the market. Um, and and so we'll get in just a moment into that that concept of the different ways that, you know, this sometimes ambiguous phrase of digital transformation can manifest yeah. and how one's digital ambitions, depending on where you are on that spectrum, may influence the types of things that you need to be measuring to capture um, the, the full value narrative from that. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. And to finish on the Gen AI example, I think the biggest gap that we saw was not related to, to that process area. It was actually related to technology leaders seeing the value for generative AI to address broad use cases, um, you know, and most likely in combination with really advanced and mature traditional AI capabilities that they already have in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like viewing it like a cherry on the top of a cake, but you have to have a cake mm -hmm. too, right? And, um, and actually, I'm, sorry? Uh, I, I, Greg, I didn't hear you. Sorry, you cut off. I, I was just going to offer, actually, if we go to the next visual, because I, I think right after is, yeah, we have a view that um, it helps sort of highlight, right, Diana, some of what you're talking about there. Um, mm -hmm. And what you see here is just, again, some of this is going to be a bit of a teaser for the more detailed um, findings that are in the study. But um, this is the view here of those 46 KPIs for where we tend to see mm -hmm. organizations using KPIs more and using them less. And if you go um, to the upper left-hand corner there, you see at a global level, um, the five top financial KPIs, budget versus actual cost is up there, right? You see margin, um, operating margin impact is up there. Those are metrics that are really conducive to having conversations around where you're driving efficiencies within your business and how those efficiencies help deliver value. Um, significantly less popular than the budget and the operating model conversation um, is that next one down, you see direct and or indirect impact on revenue. So when you think about deploying new technologies, generative AI or otherwise, um, in order to enter new markets, to generate new products, generate new services, that is a metric uh, that would be highly relevant to that scenario, but it's a metric that significantly fewer organizations are using today. And by the way, we can apply this across the um, the other categories as well, that there are certain metrics that are very popular, like in the, on the process side, um, you know, productivity, Diana called out as, uh, I think the very top one that organizations use at 81%, uh, uh, but there's some critical and, and extremely valuable KPIs below that, that, that are much less popular. Mm -hmm. um, now I did call out, when I was referencing the global top five financial KPIs, this is a global view. A lot of organizations um, that, that we've spoken to want to know, well, what about in my industry? What about in my sector? And what about in my geography? So um, maybe Diana, can you talk a little bit about the different cuts of the data that we have? Yeah, gladly. Uh, so to talk a little bit about industry, just to level set here, we looked at six different industries as part of our global mm -hmm. study. Um, and I'll get into you know, what those industries are and some of the high level differences we saw. But I think the overarching story here is that in industry matters, that industry context, um, it is defining where you as an organization fit within the broader market landscape, within the competitive set, um, within the wider ecosystem. And so your industry and your sector really dictates what your digital strategy is and mm. therefore what technology capabilities you're investing in to enable that digital strategy, if done right. Um, and what value measures may make more sense for you to be looking at based on what that digital strategy is. Um, and so as part of the global survey, we looked at these six different industries. Mm -hmm. And at a really high level, I'll go through each one um, briefly. And you know, we're going to be doing a, a full session on 
in April this the stream. 9th. On April yes. the 9th. Thank you. Yeah. April 9th. We, um, we'll deep dive here. So if you're interested in a, a deeper look at this, come come back and join us. But at a high level for consumer, what we found is that the consumer respondents, in terms of their digital strategy, where they were investing and how they were thinking about value, um, we called them product and ecosystem value leaders. They tended to be investing more um, in digital strategies that had to do with bringing new products to market. Um, they tended to be investing more in technologies like API um, capabilities that would allow them to have more interoperable technologies and function as part of a, a more decentralized ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and in terms of value, they were very focused on ROI. Um, in contrast, our financial services respondents, you know, same questions, same priorities, same capabilities for technology we asked about, and same ROI framework. So we had a good baseline to see how are these industries different? Yeah. And what we found was that financial services respondents um, were investing much more robustly in all of the different technology capabilities we asked about. And they were much more mature measures on that uh, framework that Greg was talking about, our, our KPI wheel. The wheel was lit up for them. <laughs> um, they were measuring much more with a deeper understanding of where value was coming from, but they also had a lot more technology capabilities they were investing in to manage. Life sciences and healthcare, um, quite interesting and, and different as well. Um, so they tended to be investing in some of the more, what I would say is innovative technologies um, on the spectrum, um, the scatter plot that Greg showed, some of those that were in the bottom left, like augmented and virtual reality. Um, and they also showed a higher maturity than other industries in measuring on our KPI wheel. Energy resources and industrials respondents, we saw that uh, mm. their technology capability investments tended to be more focused um, than others on secure and connected technologies. So think IoT and edge computing, yeah. much more mature in this industry. When we look at government and public sector, one of the big differences that we saw among those respondents is that they are thinking much more long term than short term about their technology investments. And if you're here joining us from government, I'm sure you know the many reasons why, procurement cycles, um, you know, the pace of change within government and, and many other factors. But um, our global survey on average, organizations tended to be planning on a quarterly or annual cycle. Whereas when we looked at government, um, this was really the only industry that had a high focus on three year plus planning cycles. Mm. So quite different for government. Yes. Um, and then finally rounding out on TMT, technology, media and telecommunications, we see very different behaviors in terms of their digital strategy and their focus on um, value. And they tend to be much more focused than other industries on product and mm. digital sales as uh, their strategy, as well as their measure of success. Yep. So I'll pause here because I know Dalibor, you do a great job of bringing our our, uh, our viewers along before I yes. move forward. So, so this is actually fantastic. What I'm taking from this is that every single industry grouping actually leads in a particular aspect, but different aspect. What mm -hmm. a great call out for technology leaders across industries to connect and learn from each other. Like this would be very, very powerful. This insight is really great. Now, there are a couple of questions that are coming from the audience. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just ask them. Uh, Absolutely. Th th there was one question really important. Obviously there are some, not some, but there are regulatory and compliance needs. Um, how, how is value calculated, articulated, or maybe addressed in the framework that you showed us uh, for that, for those sort of regularly, regulatory compliance needs. Let me just ask that as an open-ended question. Yeah, so I'm glad to start, um, Greg and Dalibor too, if you have thoughts, feel free to layer in. But I think what you'll see here is when we start to look at industry, um, highly regulated industries 
are factoring it in their KPIs and we can get into it because, you know, there's 46 KPIs in six industries here. So a lot of nuance. Yeah. Um, I'll just speak at a very high level, and I will say that when we looked at some of the challenges related to value measurement, as well as the challenges the different industries are seeing in terms of successfully implementing it, um, regulation does play in there. Um, so to take those two as separate issues, in terms of measurement challenges, um, based on your industry, things like organizational silos um, are some of the, the big areas that we see. Um, and so perhaps even regulatory reporting and, and work finding that common language to work across silos can be helpful here in addressing some of those challenges. And then on the effective implementation side, um, we see things like legacy systems, security, which might be a regulatory concern, mm -hmm. being some of the barriers standing in the way of actually achieving the value. So yeah. there's the measuring side and then there's the achieving the value side. Um, but for highly regulated industries like financial services and life sciences and healthcare, we see that they have a higher um, usage of the KPIs. So I think we can interpret that as their even though that they're highly regulated, they do have this discipline behind thinking about KPIs and where value is coming from more so than some of the other industries. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's that's fair. And I think that from 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 my experience, the clients that we work with, at least here in Canada, like the regulatory frameworks and, and, and compliance would be considered table stakes. Like that is not that that is not a measure of value necessarily it's a binary you need you need to right it's 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 part of the things that you have to do foundational table stakes greg and yeah and i was i was just going to offer so you know a number of these kpis too you could say are derivative of regulatory requirements diana referred to a few if you look within the purpose category uh there are a whole bunch right like corporate corporate reputation sustainability workforce inclusion are things that a number of industries will have direct ties back to um, specific requirements. Um, and you know, that that maybe I know as part of the series, there's going to be follow-up conversation specifically on the different cuts of this. And so we can come back to that question in the context of the industry views as to you know, certain industries where some of the certain industries that are subject to certain types of requirements. Um, what KPIs are they using more than others that would be reflective of those types of regulatory requirements? Yeah. That is probably a conversation unto itself. Yeah. But but I think that, I love what you said, actually, that throughout the 46 KPIs, some of them definitely are channels through which you can measure your adherence to, and, uh, to, to specific regulations and, and expectations there. Um, one uh, another question that came from Gordon, just just to clarify this, one of the slides actually did say that you speak you spoke with CFOs. Uh, I'm going to assume that that was not the exclusive group that was consulted, right, Diana? Yeah, great question. So I should note that in addition to the 1600 global survey, we did 10 C-suite interviews, um, which included CIOs, CTOs, CFOs, CEOs. So really functions all across the C-suite. Um, in different industries as well as different regions. So we had a nice mix um, to get a broad perspective. That's very good. So this is not just CFOs, it's much broader. Also, uh, for the audience, if we are recording this session and we will send the link to the recording and the link to the actual reports where you will be able to look at all of the details. And then the last one that I wanted to just ask is... Uh, Sebastian here asks uh, that some of these KPIs seem to be leading indicators, others seem to be lagging indicators. Any sort of commentary on that, uh, Diana and Greg? So I, um, I'll offer one or two thoughts, and then Diana, um, you know, please weigh in. I, um, an important clarification with this research, the research, because um, it, it's important to represent what the research does and does not address. And the research in this case, uh, we asked leaders about their usage of metrics, um, not necessarily why they use those metrics, right? Uh -huh. And so when we're talking about the percentages here, we're talking about there are certain KPIs that organizations, that most organizations use, and there are certain KPIs 
that um, fewer organizations use. And so we're representing the utilization of those metrics. What I will say though, is there's a very interesting conversation. It's a great question to be asking um, <clears throat> because some of these KPIs in here can be used to different ends, right? Some of them can be used strictly for retrospective purposes to do a look back and say, let's get a sense of where we are, right? That's sort of the lagging side of it. If I look, um, cause I believe the question that was posted references specifically in the workforce space, some of the metrics in the workforce space, we talk about workforce development, we talk about um, talent mobility, we talk about agility. Those things themselves can be used as leading indicators of mm -hmm. other um, you know, value, let's call them barometers in terms of you know, your productivity, your creativity, your innovation, your output, that sort of thing. Um, so again, this research looks specifically at, at which metrics people were and weren't using in the correlation between the usage of those metrics. Um, but it's a great question to probe, right? Regardless of which metrics you're using, what's the full extent to which you can use them to extract value? Diana, other thoughts on that? Yeah, great answer. I think that that point you said about intentionally looking at the metrics is really important. So um, we looked at usage. This gives you kind of a good benchmark of what global usage is um, and being able to look at that by industry or region or just globally from across industry perspective like we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. um, two additional points. So the average usage is going to be 55%. So just if you're thinking about benchmarking of you know what is average, 55% is an average number. So what you're seeing here for the top numbers are all for the most part, except for sustain sustainability, which is right at that average bar. Um, these are above average use. So if there are things on our wheel that you're not seeing here, things like average time to market or number of agile or pod teams that you might be thinking about, some of those KPIs that are not going to be appearing in this top, they're at below average use. And so I think the question there is, are, is that a conscious decision you're making? And if so, fine. Or is it not a conscious decision you're making? And I think the other utility of this framework here too is giving yourself consistency then uh, so that you are making those decisions consistently, no matter what technology it is that you're investing in for generative AI or cloud or cyber capabilities or IoT. Um, there's this since, you know, back to Greg's earlier point here of, People know it's important, but they don't know how to measure it. And therefore, the challenge with that is it leads to tremendous inconsistency across all of these capabilities where you can't really, as a CFO um, assessing technologies or as a CIO putting a business case together, you're not doing it consistently. And so part of the utility here um, that we're seeing give a lot of value is you can consistently kind of think through that intentionally every time. Yeah. Very neat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, and, and there we go. Sebastian says, hi, thank you. <laughs> so Diana, uh, th this is fantastic. And I know that, we, oh yeah, this, this, this one is, I think another, uh, another gold nugget that we gift to folks today. Can you just, orient us around this particular framework. It also came out of your research, right? It did, yeah. So we published this actually coming out of 10 global, uh, uh, sorry, 20 plus global interviews with CEOs specifically. Okay. Um, and so the idea here, and uh, I think, you know, Greg and I both like language. And when we hear digital trans transformation, it could mean every thing that you want it to be. And so as a starting point for that discussion, we really wanted to understand how are organizations thinking about what digital transformation is and what it isn't and what the CEO's role is in that? And therefore, you know, what the C-suite and other functional leaders' roles might be. Um, and so as part of that research, we put out this framework looking at really where's the line? What's the difference between something that is digitization and is true versus something that's truly transformative for the business? Um, and so this really is doing that walkthrough, you know, yeah. and we think about five different levels of change. Level zero here is incremental digitization of your data and your processes. And, you know, quite honestly, as um, people are looking at generative AI investments, 
we see more and more that if they don't have this level zero in place, you need a solid data foundation to really do anything. So, you know, it's not to say that those that are focusing on level zero are not doing something incredibly valuable, but this is really the ground floor, digitizing your business to succeed in, in a digital world. This is level so, one, yeah. So just to, 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 to pause here, how many hundreds of millions of dollars of investment has gone into ERP modernization, for mm -hmm. example, Organizations calling it digital transformation, organizations expecting maximum business value from it, where when you actually take a look at what's happening really and where the investment is going, it's actually just digitizing existing process on the left. And mm -hmm. th this is a very, very important framework to use to explain how, how much value you ought to be expecting on, based on different types of digital transformations you could choose to embark on. But right, there's a discrepancy between if you're really doing level zero, but you're positioning it as this is going to change our competitive advantage and it isn't, this is an immediate gap. And many people still call that digital transformation, confusing it with what digital transformations on the right actually mean, right? Yeah. And it's not to say with your ERP example that investing in ERP modernization and your processes is not incredibly important. You of know, course. we put out other research on ERP specifically showing um, that prolonged investments in ERP leads to optimization and productivity and long term stock price overperformance. So this mm -hmm. is all incredibly valuable stuff. It's just not transformation. It is yeah. incremental digitization of your business that can be highly valuable in the term in terms of data and processes, and then also for level one, modernizing your platforms. And I think you know the move to cloud could be an important example of this. Is you're in terms of advanced digitization if you haven't moved to the cloud, moving to the cloud, just you know lifting and shifting your existing business processes over to the cloud, but not really transforming um, how the business operates or what you're taking to market. Mm -hmm. On the right side of this, we start to get into the really transformative stuff. So things like entering new markets, mm -hmm. creating and introducing new digital products to the market, mm -hmm. um, and then radically transforming your business. This is this is what, one of the favorite things that I've seen actually this year. I got to tell you, uh, your you. 46 KPIs is another one of the favorite things I've seen this year. But this is so helpful to have executive conversation, board conversation, CEO conversation, and be explicit. This can be used to figure out who should be the executive sponsor of these different types of transformations to ensure right executive support and visibility, right? This is very, very good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I think what we're super excited about with this new research is now we've been able to build on this view and put data behind it, right? So where are organizations investing? And so we have the overall view. Um, what I'm showing here, since we're talking about industries now, is um, a continuation of, of that conversation on industry is that we see that different industries um, out of 100% of their investment dollars are intentionally choosing to spend in different areas. Uh, and so, for example, financial services respondents are spending more than other industries on digitization of data. You see this big 52% blue slice on the right here. Um, whereas government and public services organization are more focused on that level four fundamental business change um, than other industries are. Uh, they're still, uh, that's 57% uh, for them. And sorry, for financial services, that was 52% on the fundamental change. And digitization of data is, is not the blue, it's the light green there, 19%. Mm -hmm. Uh, and for technology, media, and telecommunications, we see that they tend to be focusing more on digital platforms 
and new product development. And, you know, that makes sense given the nature of their businesses. So I'll, I'll stop here again. Very neat. Actually, to be honest with you, I am, I am, um, I am pretty encouraged by the amount of dark blue that I see. Right. It's, 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 it indicates that across all of these industries, actually significant investment is going into the actual, right. The way I read the actual fund transformation of the enterprise. Yeah. And so to speak to that, I think on average, if we were looking at the global data, just a single pie chart of this, what you would see is about almost an even 50, 50 split on the mm -hmm. spectrum, yeah. give yeah. or take a few percentage points. Yeah. Um, so we can see here which industries are are trending in which direction in their priorities. Um, yeah. And so at a capability level, um, this is another view of the scatter plot that Greg spoke about earlier, is we can see how um, you know data and analytics was in that top right position. It's the most invested in technology capability we can start to benchmark based on industry. And you know this isn't a value judgment, right or wrong, but you can see which industries are investing more or less in specific technology capabilities. So to call out a few, um, government is investing 10 percentage points less in AI and machine learning in 2023. So the average is 70% of respondents are investing, but we can see you know, a 10% fewer um, comparatively within government. Also mobile, technology, media, and telecommunications, you know, these areas in red, few, uh, 12 percentage points fewer there. IoT, 12% fewer. 4G, 17% fewer. Um, and so maybe this is a good thing with uh, TMT then being more likely to be investing in 5G and 6G and other technologies instead of 4G. Yeah. Very, 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 very neat. Um, there is a question from Abhinav um, on the amount of effort, like the percent of budget that digital transformation leaders ought to consider for you know, it, pointing to value measurement, value realization. I'm not sure if there is any insights or any experience you can share on how you see organizations who do this really, really well. How do they think about and fund? Um, uh, that part of the program, I guess. Yeah, well, no, Greg, do you want to start? I, yeah, I would offer one or two thoughts because I think there was a question earlier too that included a question of <clears throat> um, whether something to the effect of whether this gives us a a framework or a, a framework or a benchmark that we can bring out to um, client organizations. That the short answer is uh, so that question specifically about percent of budget should be um, dedicated to um, managing value realization. Um, this study did not ask that question. Um, we don't have an answer specific to that question um, in the context of the study. I think what this study does give um, the reader, which is helpful in service of that question, is it gives really good reference data around here's what your peers in industry are doing. And then um, just a quick teaser, we also have geographic views too, so we can say for different geographies. I think we've got uh, US, Canada, um, Australia, France, Germany, and the UK. Um, so for the different industry groups, for the different geographies, here's where your peer group is in terms of the things that they're looking at from a value perspective. Part of the message is many organizations can stand to do more, to have a more holistic view, right? But then you can also say relative to our peer group, um, here's where we maybe, you know, do or do not have a complete view. And then that gives some inspiration around where you may want to invest additional effort and resources in getting that more comprehensive view. To the question that um, came up earlier around, um, around whether it gives sort of a, a, um, a baseline for people to benchmark, um, again, your organization's own um, you know, answer is going to be what's right for your organization. But this does help give a lot of reference data. Um, Diana was joking earlier, I showed up to one of our meetings when we were going through the research with a 200 page printout of, you know, the most interesting findings uh, <laughs> of this. And so it's very data rich. And I would encourage anyone who's interested to spend the time going through the data and see what sort of, um, you know, inspires you to, to go to your peers and to say, look, we should be thinking differently. Um, you know, we should be adding this or we should be probing more on that.
and and that is okay because this is new actually so it, it, so so like we are building this as as we go right so the insight that we are sharing now is hot off the press so these are the things that haven't existed before hence opportunity for you to take this back to the executives now right now so 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 yeah absolutely thanks for that and yeah, Diana, and i, would I know, just add to greg's point here uh thanks for the opportunity that uh this is a long list of technologies right and so the problem that i raised earlier is you know with t with the we we have some data from our, our CFO signals sh showing that even in this economic environment, organizations are still planning on increasing heavily in technology. We know that this is the list of technologies and that they're going to the CFO, the CEO, and the board, depending on their size and structure, to you know, to get big budgets approved for the technology estate. Um, and our latest data shows that in particular with generative AI, they only expect the number that they're asking for to increase. Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing that this study does is it gives you a consistent set of KPIs to have a more apples to apples comparison than an apples to orange comparison to build better business cases that really think about the value that you're trying to achieve. And so I know that we like, you know, the tech budget to revenue number and that historically that's been a good benchmark, you know, for organizations in the past, or at least a go-to benchmark. But what we're really challenging is to think differently about that um, and to think about what you need the investment to do for your business aligned to the larger overarching business goals. And the market cap analysis shows that when you think that way and bring those three things together, that that's really where tremendous value can be gained. Sure. So I think my answer is, you know, you need to invest what you need to invest. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and as the new insights comes up, embedded this part of the conversation. And I know you mentioned we do have a regional view. so. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, if we can just maybe touch on that, and then we will invite people to come back for those sessions. Now, I'll give the quickest of teasers on that. Um, so as you can see here, um, regional views, uh, in addition to the global view that we've been talking about, we do have views um, that are cut by the um, the locations you see represented here, um, US, Canada, Australia, Germany, France, um, and in the UK. Um, it, maybe not exactly in that order, my apologies. <laughs> I was... Uh, reading too quickly, uh, but just a quick visual then um, to, you know, to tease a little bit, as Diana mentioned, um, the global view gives us a sense of um, the the averages uh, that we're seeing. So if you talk about that digital transformation spectrum uh, and where organizations tend to fall along that, you will see that there are differences um, mm -hmm. on a regional level in terms of where organizations put themselves. And between, um, you know, one region and another, there may be some pretty stark contrast. You see in the case of level four, you know, the highest of these is at 59%, the lowest at 44. That's a meaningful percentage difference in yeah. terms of the number of um, leaders within uh, those regions who put themselves in that category. Um, what, what I, you know, found super interesting is if we take the example of, of Canada um, on level four, so Canada is 50%, really only a couple percentage points different um, in level four. Uh, versus the global average level three, same thing, one percentage point difference. Um, and so, at the at the highest level, you see it's actually in a number of places quite close um, to that global average. It's what sits beneath all of that in terms of the investments people are making, in terms of the metrics that people are using, um, where that's going to get very um, interesting because you can say, look, in the aggregate, we're not that far from the global average, but there are some specific nuances. And I believe that's what we're going to be getting into in one of our um, subsequent our next sessions. Exactly. So this this brings us to the end, and we are right on time. So Diana and Greg, I want to thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom and experience you've shared with us today, uh, and and uh, for the audience members who are with us on April the 9th, we will reconvene to do a deeper dive into these six industries and the details around the industries, and then. Uh, a week later, on April the 16th, we'll look at a regional view of, of this. So please plan to come back. You will, of course, 
get links to register both on our LinkedIn page, but also through the regular email communication. With that, I want to thank you all very much. And I wish everybody a happy Tuesday. All the best. Bye-bye.